So this talk functions as both a prequel and a sequel uh, to an article I recently published titled Digitizing Ephemera and Its Discontents, Ebba's Quest to Capture the Protean Broadside Ballad. Uh, Ebba is the acronym for the English Broadside Ballad Archive at the University of California, Santa Barbara, of which I am the director. EBA archives all surviving ballads published in English during the 17th century, a time when the broadside ballad was in its heyday as a multimedia artifact, consisting of a single large sheet of paper printed on one side, often divided into two parts, with multiple eye-catching illustrations, a popular tune title, and an alluring poem usually printed in swirling black letter, what we today call Gothic type. Ebba has to date archived 6,000 of the estimated 12, 10 to 12,000 extant English broadsides pre 1701. Now, broadside ballads during this period were intended for a mass audience. The single most printed medium in the literary marketplace of London, they were hopped in the city streets and sent into the provinces in the packs of peddlers by the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions. Indeed, one could not travel from point A to point B in London without having ballads sung on street corners or seeing them pasted up on posts and walls. Ballads thus taught all levels of society. Still, they were decidedly aimed at and embraced by the low. They were printed on the cheapest paper using recycled worn woodcuts so as to be affordable to all but the very poorest of society. Indeed, they cost on average a mere penny or hate penny, to increase their audience to include the semi-literate well into the 17th century when the texts were being issued in white letter or Roman type, ballads were still being printed in black letter or Gothic type, which was the print by which children learned to read and was also associated with Old England. To increase their allure, ballads towards the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th century became increasingly ornamental with decorative lines and illustrations. People of the lower to middling sort would buy ballads to paste them up on their walls as ornaments. Finally, ballads of this period were sung to simple, well-known tunes, so well-known that just the tune title needed to be printed, as you can see here. Um, and that, of course, made them even more accessible to the uneducated. To add icing to the visual and oral cake of the ballad, the subject of ballads expanded at the beginning of the 17th century to include all kinds of topics of all interest to all kinds of people. And this is a husband murder ballad. Um, this is about drinking, of course, from the Rossborough Collection of the British Library. And this is about love from the Crawford Collection of the National Library of Scotland. The 17th century heyday of the printed ballad then marks a high point in the history of the genre. Um, and this is a half sheet, which was a revival in the 17th century of the full sheet with the two parts, but it's a slightly smaller, still ornamental in black letter. But even if millions of such ballads were already being mass disseminated, most were lost to posterity. They were pasted on walls or recycled as pie lining, pipe kindling, toilet paper, and the like. <laughs> Thus, despite being on the scene, and witnessing these artifacts as disposable ephemera of the passing moment, violent collectors like Samuel Pepys, John Bagford, and Robert Harley engaged in an extraordinarily impressive and important feat of preservation. That said, extant originals are highly guarded at libraries on either side of the pond. Uh, microfilm copies are also difficult to locate and read. Most printed editions are partial and offer only selections and even then only transcriptions with no duplication of the ballad's original formatting and two illustrations. And in the cases of facsimile editions, we encounter the opposite problem, no easily readable transcriptions. Early English books online has to date failed to come to the rescue since many extant ballads have yet to be mounted in its database. Nor can those that are online be easily searchable by title since ballad titles are often long and rambling. Nor by collection, nor by finer <coughs> cataloging details that allow one to study ballads as a distinctive and multimedia phenomenon. And in all cases to date, whether originals, printed selections, printed facsimiles, or digital reproductions, 
the accompanying ballad tunes are not sung. Ever thus fills a real need, making brass eye bells fully accessible as texts, art, music, and cultural records of the period. Now this sounds like a clear, easy goal, but clarity is rare in digitizing ephemera. In the paper I present here, I want to look more closely at the problem of holding to standards in the digitizing of any archive, but especially in the digitizing of an archive of ephemera, which by their very transient and disposable nature tend to mutate the form and function as they are handed down and around over space and time. So holding to standards, I'm beginning with the image and these three questions. What is the ephemeral artifact? Even with the main focus of the archive seemingly clear, the, the, the broadside ballot, I and my team immediately faced a question. What view of the printed ballot are we going to capture? Broadside ballots have been passed down to us by collectors in various forms. In album books, wherein the ballot has been trimmed and often cut into two parts to fit the facing pages of the album, or even onto a single page of the book. In album folders, contained within boxes, each folder holding an individual ballot pasted onto backing paper, and the folders usually gathered in some kind of order, often alphabetically by title or by first line. Or just as loose sheets, piled or found randomly, which curators themselves have placed in cardboard boxes with other single sheets of various kinds, or separately in ungathered individual folders. No matter how they are currently gathered, often the individual ballot sheets show signs of previous bindings. You can see that here with this uh, uh, sheet that's in two, been torn apart. You can see an inner part of the album paper which had been ripped out. Or you can sometimes see tape for binding or stitching marks. That is, there's a prehistory before they've been arrested in their current and final setting. But we cannot reconstruct that interim history since bindings and unbindings of ballots can be multiple and variable. And we have no evidence of clear previous ways they were gathered or ordered. The surest and most valuable archival standard you could hold to, we thus concluded, was to photograph everything. Not only the broadside ballot, but its larger contextual surround, both the ballot and its physical setting, often created by its final collector. So how to photograph the whole thing. Libraries were instructed to film the entire physical context in which the broadside ballad currently exists. In the case of the album book, um, which we saw previously, they were asked to film the entire album page, or the left and then right sides of the book if the object was too large, being sure to show the edges of the book cover or backing sheet, as well as include a ruler and color scale placed beside, not on, the image, and you'd be surprised how often that wasn't observed. They should further film the artifact as color tiffs at 600 ppi at original size, or as close to that as possible, which is the U.S. archival standard. In cases where rephotographing the originals was not an option, and all we can work with is the microfilm, as was the case with most of the Peeps ballads, which were also unfortunately unbound when microfilmed in the 1980s so that we cannot provide users with an album book image. We have worked from high quality microfilm, which we had digitized to the highest standards in 2004, um, at the time we were working with them, which was 400 ppi. <laughs> I should add that a holding institution's attitude to photographing its ephemera, now universally perceived to be precious, as opposed to disposable, <laughs> necessarily influences how the artifacts can be filmed and how we as digital archivists might portray them to users. The British Library, for instance, considers the digital images of the ballad ephemera it creates with a camera as akin, in iconic fashion, to the real thing. It thus insisted that we minimally manipulate the images they provided us. This firm position forced us to resort to microfilm for creating different viewings of the British Library images, as I'll discuss. Uh, institutions we've since worked with have been more liberal in their attitude to our manipulating their images. So what do we do with the digital images? Once large TIFF digital images are obtained by Eva, the raw files are converted into PSDs and Adobe Photoshop by the Eva team. In the process, misaligned images are straightened, extraneous materials, borders, rulers, color bars, etc. removed. 
And while preserving as much as possible the look of the originals, illustrations are enhanced and troublesome blocks of text are sharpened to render them more readable. Enter the next dilemma. Should we show the ballad as collected even if it is trimmed or cut in half? Or should we put its parts back together, thus violating any perceived iconicity of the final state of the ephemeral artifact? And what about transcriptions? Black letter, um, the most common typeface of the 17th century ballad, is extremely difficult to read for the non-expert. But if we just provide a transcription of the ballad, don't we lose its important experience as song and art? It finally dawned on us that here was the advantage of a digital archive we could have our cake and eat it too, as long as we held to consistent standards. We decided that the saved PSD should be converted into three versions or viewings of the original, if all viewings can be delivered, as album facsimile, as ballad cheat facsimile, and as facsimile transcription. Now, album facsimiles are digital images created in Adobe Photoshop of the broadside ballads together with the backing papers or book papers onto which they have been pasted by a collector or collectors. This is the last incarnation of the ephemeral object. Where full album page shots are available, but each page has been shot separately by the library, we were faced with another question. Should we show just one page at a time or facing pages? We concluded that the collector's decision to place not only parts of the same uh, ballads, but also different ballads facing each other is significant and further influences a viewer's experience of the album book. So we decided to always show facing pages of the album books. When the pages are photographed separately, we insert a thin line uh, dividing the two pages so that the reader recognizes they were not photographed in one image. Putting the two halves together uh, is uh, a tricky <laughs> task and uh, extremely challenging sometimes when, as in the case of the British Library, they decide to film all the left pages of the book and then film all the right pages of the book. Um, therefore, the camera was at a different angle, the lighting was different, and particularly when you're in the early parts of the book, they're holding up the right part while they film the left, um, and holding up the left part while they film the right. It's very hard to create a sense of the album book. But some are very successful. This is a, a piece um, of cut apart sheet where we're right back in the middle of the book, so it, we were able to create a, a very good approximation. Ballad sheet facsimiles are digital approximations of what the original printed ballads would have looked like when they came off the press. When a ballad sheet has been trimmed, as is typical, we create, recreate an outer border. When the ballad sheet has not only been trimmed, but also cut in half and pasted onto an album page, we trim away the album page and put the two halves back together, recreating a, both a border and an inner mark margin between the two halves. That's only transcriptions are created by first transcribing the original, often difficult to read typeface in the modern times Roman, according to strict rules of transcription. And these transcriptions are double keyed for a high degree of accuracy. Once a modern transcription is made, the ballad sheet facsimile as a PSD um, is brought up in Photoshop. The image of color is grayscale and further adjusted for black and white text. Blocks of the original text are cut out and replaced with a modern transcription. Line breaks and text size conventions in the original are observed as closely as possible so that the resulting facsimile transcription will resemble the layout of the original ballot. By toggling between all three image views, a user gains appreciation of the way the ballots were collected over time via the album facsimile, of how they emerged from the printing press in their own time via the ballad sheet facsimile, and of how a literate contemporary might have read the ballad, that is, with the same ease we read modern print, while also admiring its ornament via the facsimile transcription. Finally, the ballad transcription is viewable as text transcriptions from which one can link to the raw XML and integrate it into the database to enable full text um, searching. So here's the raw XML of the, the 
about. Now I want to get to the standards of information architecture. EBI utilizes a four-pronged um, image recording database SQL XML backbone to ensure the scholarly value of the collection. A web-based user interface and a web service that allows interchangeability of resources across users and platforms. EBA's database um, is thus format agnostic. The database does not follow any single metadata standard. And one of the ways we can achieve this is that every single item is its own artifact. So first names are their own individual piece, and as our last names, as our first birthdays, as our death dates. So that um, another, um, uh, somebody who wanted to convert it to Library of Congress or at Mark Record can easily do that um, because of our uh, keeping everything separate within the back side of the database. TEI XML files are generated using the XVALID application created by EBA's Associate Director Carl Stamer, specifically for EBA. XVALID allows editors on the back end to generate TEI XML for ballads by identifying textual units using a simple point and click interface or take them through how you do it and just told. The application then generates TEI XML for the ballad as we saw before. With XVALID, Textual editors thus need not have direct knowledge of TEI or XML, and all coding is standardized. Cataloging the ballots. We catalog a wide uh, range of metadata for our sources. In general, we aim for thin mark TEI and Library of Congress subject headings for interchangeability in ORE. But this thin cross-walkable metadata is supplemented with content-specific thicker metadata sets some custom developed in some of the wide range of standard sources to ensure granularity for the XML metadata that will accompany each ballot. Just to give you a sense of the um, granularity, here is our, um, all the various um, ways we enter information about the ballot and um, an explanation of what they mean. Um, where our methodology is explained, how we find dates is explained. In the advanced search, everything is standardized by drop-down, so you can't go in and um, mess up the spelling of a name or spell first name, last name. You'll, you have to drop down and find the name this way. So it controls um, your um, your use, but but also um, helps you in your use in finding things. Everything's Boolean in search. Um, the EBA keywords, 52 of them, are defined as well, and you would be surprised how difficult it was to define these terms. So that when someone clicks on a, a keyword, they know what they're getting. They know what exactly it is. Supernatural does not mean God, for instance, like angels. A citation example is, um, would look like this. And this just the information that is available for this ballot would come up. More in some cases, less in others. Tunes. Tunes are additionally cataloged and separately searchable by imprint, tune title, and standard tune title. That is, the title assigned to variant names of the same tune. For example, tune result, um, one can see here, uh, the tune imprint is what's printed on the ballot page, aim not too high, but there's a standard tune title for that created by Claude Simpson, which is a kind of um, esteemed resource for all ethnomusicologists of this period, and he creates um, standardized names and then um, lists the variants so that people can um, check that, that title against standardized titles and see whether it fits. So there, um, the standardized uh, titles based on the, this authority um, and therefore um, is standardized and is also available through a drop down. So you'll know all the tunes that are available as, you can also search by the title on the sheet. Um, 
but this is another way of certain way to be standard type. In performing ballads, we also employ the same standards throughout. A team of ethnomusicologists have carefully considered a number of factors that impact the interpretation of the ballad as song and have chosen a comfortable, natural speaking tone, tending towards clear articulation with minimal ornamentation and vibrato so as not to obscure the basic melody or text. We've also decided to record most of the ballads a cappello since the solo voice gives the most unadorned version of the melody and clearly illustrates the connection between words and music. I wasn't going to play this, but since the sound is in the air, we'll just hear a little bit. are also separately cataloged and searchable by keywords via checkbox lists. And um, the woodcut impressions are treated like independent objects too. Um, so that they, but, but they, we want to be able to associate the ones that are like other ones. Um, so that multiple ballad images that are, fall into the same group, which we can name. This is not as simple process as they seem. <laughs> okay, that gets to the next section, the protein challenge. Even the most apparently rule-based standards and cataloging systems, and you can see we've been striving to be standard, 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 are generally unstable in, in nature. So just, I'm just talking about the standards. Um, the ESTC, for instance, which you know, you know is the gold standard of uh, cataloging, is inconsistent in how it shows titles. Sometimes uh, multiple titles are entered on under the title. Sometimes one is on title, one's a variant title. Sometimes one is in the title field and the others are in the variant uh, and notes. So that um, here's an example of three songs on a page and they give it as title, the three songs. But here's an example of three songs on a page, Languishing Husband, Cupid's Recruiting Sergeant, and The Wandering Blackbird and they've cataloged it as the languishing husband. And you have to look close to see that it also includes these other two titles. And if you search for those two titles, you get the languishing husband. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, TEA markup keeps changing on us. So in 2007, Sid Bauman and Julia Fleming came out to UCSB and said, yes, you've done it right. We were using TEIP4. In 2010, they came out after TEIP5 had been created and said, what are you doing? This is wrong. And we said, you said it was right. <laughs> um, so we had to redo it. Uh, Mark is a problem because it's designed for texts that are books, um, not for texts that are ballads, so that we have to put under format book. Um, and then uh, under title, it insists that anything after a, a punctuation mark be the subtitle. But ballad titles are these long rambling titles with have pressure marks thrown all the way through them in a very um, inconsistent way so that it's really all of the title. We can't divide it up in that way. Oh, I just have to show you icon class. So this is a system that we've rejected, but um, it's, it's widely used in Europe. Uh, it's a taxonomy that's a tree system. And um, the problem is that um, uh, basically um, there are all these leaves in this tree that are messing it up and very difficult <laughs> to find, making it find, difficult to find your way through the branches. So anyone would enter the, uh, in their own way in trying to catalog an image and then it gets the number two, let's say, if they do nature. And then they have to choose what kind of nature mm -hmm. and then within that what kind of thing and so you get down to plants and vegetables, but here we're at 2, 2, 5, 2, 5, G, and now we have to decide which one. Well, is it an extinct plant or is it a fantastic plant? And, you know, um, and I'm not kidding, this, it's used, it's very much used, especially for high art. It does not work for, I don't think it works for high art, but it certainly doesn't work for ballads. Okay. Um, 
I'm making fun of all this, but it's actually not the problem of people who invented the ESTC or MARC or, P or, or um, TEI. If this shifting this, the apparent instability of these methods, isn't the result of poor standards, but of the very elusive nature of signification in general. Added to that is, of course, the shape shifting of the collector's hands. Ballon collectors are highly changeable and unpredictable in how they choose to preserve their ephemera. Collectors arrange and rearrange their collections, and they create categories that become inconsistent and fall apart. Peeps, who is the most anal person on the face of the earth, um, cr created all these um, themes by which he gathered his ballads through his five volumes, um, giving the pages in each volume for that theme. He obviously ran out of steam, though, because uh, in volume four, Love Pleasant is pages one to 72. But then he decides that Love Unfortunate is ditto. <laughs> one, page one to 72. And, and you can't have Love Pleasant and Love Unfortunate on the same pages. Well, I guess you could, but I think you just <laughs> Collectors trim and cut apart ballads, but they are inconsistent in how they show the cut apart ballads, creating confusion over parts and even adding their own ornamentation to the apparent ballad page. This is what a typical early um, first volume um, looks like in the Roxborough. This ornamentation here is in the album book itself. The ballad's been cut into, trimmed, and pasted on uh, facing pages. But in volume two, where we get these half uh, folio sheets, they decide to take the second half here and shove it down below the first half. So it's been cut so closely here, we can't even tell whether there is a title above it saying the second part. Here, I just love this. He t so he's got some spare paper, so he takes part of the ornament of the album paper and pastes it into the ballad to, to show the separation between the first half and the second half. And it looks just like the kind of ornamentation you see in ballads, as if he's creating his own version of a ballad. OK, collectors will even trickily rearrange leftover pieces of a ballad to create a look-alike whole. And this is probably my favorite. Um, the Scotch Wedding, done by the Ewing, uh, someone in the Ewing collection somewhere along the line. If you look closely at this, you'll see um, differences in the color of the paper. And you'll see the lines here, one line another line here, and there's another line here. Basically, there are four pieces that have been patched together. And it looks like a ballad. It's got a title, it's got the ornament after it, and then it's got two lines of verse. The thing is that if you read the verse, it doesn't make any sense. If you have to go this way, and then over here this way, and then this down this way, and over down this way. So we're thinking, what the heck is going on? Ha-ha, we have many versions of this ballad in it because we catalog everything. So we went to the various versions, and they look like this. What happened? Well, clearly this was a very attractive image to someone, and they cut it out. Um, they, they probably cut out this as well because we see the cut marks of that. But they take the, this one away, and they don't give it back. So the collector's got four pieces. And what does he do? Well, he creates what looks like a whole ballad out of the four pieces. What do we do for the ballad sheet facsimile? We have to make it look like it came off the press. Well, what we did, you know, after much discussion, is this. <laughs> um, okay. The ballad's mobile form. Okay. On top of everything else, ballads themselves change, evolve, even mutate over time as do most ephemera. Ballads divide into two parts um, early in the century, but then they, they start getting multiple parts within columns, and, um, and sometimes some images within the columns that start to look like chapbooks, and I think they're competing with chapbooks. I talk about this in Digitizing It's Discontents. Um, they start evolving from black letter to white letter, and in the process, the form changes. So here's that familiar picture of Jock, Jockey and Jenny, and Peeps also has a white letter version. And it looks more like this. It's, it's in Roman font. And you see musical score, which starts turning up towards the end of the 17th century in imitation and competition with cheap songbooks, uh, Jenny Jim. So it's the same song turned into a cheap songbook. Oh, sorry. 
Tunas persist um, over time, but their titles change, as discussed earlier, making standardization of tunes tricky. We do have Claude Simpson, who will help us a lot. But here is Fortune My Foe, the most favorite song of the 17th century. It turns out of the 17th century and 16th century in Holland, too, um, which is interesting. But it has different names because as each ballad is produced and gets popular, the name changes. So you, you can see it's got all these different godly man's instruction. Here it's um, aim not too high and the, the different names change. And then the ethnomusicologists have to, have to figure out whether in fact you can sing it to this other name tune or not. Woodcuts. They fade, or they break apart, or they're broken apart, or they're remade. So here's our favorite lady. We call her the artichoke lady. And I caught a class she would be 41D262. <laughs> Two indicates her fan. So she appears in so many different remakings and redrawings. Here she is in a different drawing. Her dress is black. Thank you. Um, That's 30 minutes. Oh, dear. Um, here she is really late, another redrawing, but she's very old, um, even though with a young face, because she's got wormholes, and her fan's worn off. Oh dear, <laughs> she can't have a tube. Um, so that iconoclast could not handle her, but she belongs with these sisters. She is part of that family. We can't just leave her out, because her fan wore off. Similarly, um, this woodcut on the left of the peasant uh, approaching the middle class woman, somebody decided to break it in half or broke in half, and we have the middle class woman all by herself talking to the devil. Um, <laughs> she belongs with this woodcut. They are part of, it's a part of that family, the subdivision. I'm getting close to the end. So what we need is uh, Menelaean um, uh, archives. I'm referring to Menelaus who wrestled with Proteus, and he was a shape changer. You could only um, stop him from shaping Change, change, change in shape if you can pin him down, but then you have to let him go because um, he's a god. Um, and so that we're in this process of constantly pinning things down through the database, through our scholars, our experts. Um, you know, we read 1,800 Greek spells, then we created the vowel, the, the EBA um, keywords. We have specialist ethnomusicologists, woodcut specialist team, We've been working six years on the woodcuts. Um, so we can, we have to continually change the database, change our thinking as we go along. And in the end it becomes, and this is the very final phase, the meaning of mind and machine, or systemized destabilization. That is, and I'm referring specifically to the woodcuts, because they are the most maddening facet of ephemera. Since 2006, we have struggled with cataloging and woodcuts. We began with the long narrative descriptions the Blake Archive used. They became inconsistent. Somebody was describing one long thing, somebody else was describing one not other long thing. We went to keywords and short descriptions. Other people were using different keywords. We attempted to standardize descriptions by replacing names with salient features, described left to right, foreground to background, which is our historian's method that became too long, too hard to remember. We attempted to standardize the resulting sets by just putting down um, the nouns um, as keywords. And that was with some success. That's what the way we, uh, we cataloged the woodcuts of the Peak Spell. But we stopped because we came to the, the light came back on. And we finally came to the realization that you can't make a virtual match only visually. In comes the Ballad Impressions Association tool. With an NEH startup grant, Carl Stamer is building a program to recognize um, and associate like digital images already in its um, yes. data phase. So we can use it already at the back end. Meanwhile, the impressions team led by Megan Palmer Brown has cut out each woodcut impression in every ballad in EBA, that's 10,000, so that the impressions will be quickly searchable by the computer vision software, both to the catalogers and end users. They've also developed a new cataloging method to complement the new computer software. And this is, a, is going to sound complicated, too. Um, so they, they rejected, they went to the art, art history tactics, rejected them, came up with the idea of 15 genre terms and uh, 17 descriptive tags. So here are the genre terms, the gene, generic genre terms. 
here are the descriptive tags, and each of those has within it um, between 3 and 35 terms. How could one remember that? Well, one can't. It's complicated, too. It's very specific to our knowledge of the ballots, which um, we have been in operation since 2003. So, um, last page. The cataloging of the impressions did not commence until the image association tool was largely functional. After one image has been hand cataloged and after the cataloger accepts associations with that image, which are made by the valid image associations tool, the program will automatically populate all the associated images with the same checkmark categories in a consistent way. And when catalogers identify an association not yet caught by the image vision software, they can simply pull up an already associated image that matches it, checkmark the new impression to be added to its group, and the cataloging of the new impression will also be automatically done. Once completed, and even in process, this cyborg-like system will allow catalogers to work with the valid impressions association tool to identify nuances in the impressions that will allow them to determine differences in the woodblocks themselves. And this is a, um, a beta example of, of what we mean. This is where we've already got the machine and um, the cataloger work together. This is the, uh, the, the, the um, artichoke lady, but we've already been able to identify, because she's been grouped together so many times, the various blocks. This is block A. We know now that there are six blocks, and they have specific features. And some, the cataloging of woodcut impressions, like most everything else in EVO, will be accomplished through an interface that is truly a collaborative interface of machine and mind in a process where both are always adjusting and changing. Such a de systemized destabilization <laughs> will capture the unsettled, transient, changeable, disposable, and repurposed broadside ballad, but both in its own time and has been passed down to us through its collectors. 